as, as I said earlier, really what we're doing when we're teaching anybody to play anything is develop habit strength, uh, not only physically, but intellectually as well. Right? How do you think about this? How do you habitually think about it? How do you habitually physically move your body to do this? And I think to do that requires much, much more repetition than most people imagine. Um, if you and I are sitting having dinner together and we're having a conversation and I tell you a story, and then after the story's over, I tell you the story again, uh, and then after that story's over the second time, I say, well, let me just say it one more time and sort of explain this to you. You wouldn't have many dinners with me because I would seem odd. And I think a problem in teaching often is people take that social convention and apply that when they're in a different role, and that is the role of a teacher. Um, the most undervalued uh, aspect of, effect, of effective teaching is redundancy. Uh, we need to hear things a lot. The reason we need to hear things repeatedly is each new repetition allows us to practice thinking about it in a somewhat different way. And I think often when teachers are introducing new ideas to learners, they introduce the idea, the learner seems to get it, and the teacher thinks, okay, we're finished with that now. Well, you're never finished with anything. I mean, I write for a living, right? And I'm never finished with learning how to write. I'm practicing writing all the time. And every time I get feedback from a colleague or a student or somebody I ask to read my work, I, I'm learning something from that feedback that's refining the way I do what I do. And I think often um, all of our students who come to our program here who are going to be teachers are generally terrific at introducing new ideas to learners. They're really good at that. What they're pretty terrible at is refining things that learners have already been introduced to in the past. And I think because most teachers feel really comfortable with the introducing part and much less comfortable with the, re with the refining part, that gets sort of pushed aside. So when we see a student working on something and the teacher shows them a new idea, the student starts to do the new idea and they kind of do it, well, now the only way to engage a student at the next level is we introduce yet another idea. And so progress in learning is the introduction of one idea or one skill after another, when instead it should be the introdu introduction of many fewer ideas that are then refined over time. One thing that I think about all the time is that learning is error correction. And by error correction, I don't mean make an error and get corrected by your teacher. I mean self-error correction. If you think about what actually motivates a brain to expend the energy to reorganize itself, which is what learning is, right? The prime motivator is a discrepancy between what you expect to happen or what you intend to have happen and what actually happens. And that discrepancy is the nature and resolving that dissonance between what is and what you'd like to have be the case is the nature of learning. Now, if I'm a learner and you're my teacher and you're a very well-intended teacher and you're trying to be very deliberate about making sure I do everything correctly so every time I do something incorrectly, you fix me, then over time, what I'm learning is do something, get fixed by my teacher, and then keep going. And what I'm not learning is how to evaluate what I'm doing and make corrections in what I'm doing myself. That should be the purpose of every lesson. The reason for lessons is to learn how to practice. That's it. And typically what teachers do is they do most of the directing in lessons and then expect that a learner, when they practice, will behave similarly on their own. But my argument with teachers all the time is what lessons should be is guided practice on the part of the student. Now, what that requires on the part of the teacher is not talking all the time, uh, which for all of us who are teachers who love to talk is a challenge. But I think what happens when you start to talk less and direct less and let the student decide more of what's going to happen next and what do you think needs to happen next. You create a different kind of learner because I, I don't know of any teacher who isn't frustrated, at least to some extent, by the lack of progress that people make between lessons on their own. And I think the explanation of that is quite simple, right, is that they've never learned how to make progress on their own. Because if you can't watch a student make progress on their own in your presence, then I promise you they're unlikely to make progress on their own when they're alone. I mean, everybody who's become a great musician has learned how to make those refinements on their own. Now, many of us learn that because we're smart and we're intuitive and we're highly discriminating and we learn how to do that. But if you expect that of most learners, you've shut off 90% of the world, right? And I'm not just talking about in music. I'm talking about 
writing well doing some athletic activity well whatever it happens to be